Good morning, everyone. Um, first, uh, thank you. And thank you for the organizers for the wonderful work that you work. I mean, it's wonderful. I'm privileged to be here, so thank you. And um, I'll start. And can we uh, circulate? Thank you. Now, um, the prominent uh, Sephardic French scholar Javad Naon, who passed away exactly a year ago, exactly a year ago, dwelled a lot on the exchanges between Sephardic Jews in Western Europe and the Americas during the early modern era. Among his articles on the subject were The Portuguese Jewish Nation of Saint Esprit de Bayonne, The American Dimension, published in 1996 in the collection The Jews of the Expansion of Europe to the West, uh, Amsterdam and the Portuguese Nassau in the Caribbean in the 18th century, published in 2014 in the collection The Jews uh, in the Caribbean, and Nefutsot Yehuda Bayon and Berachava Shalom, Suriname, Livre et Lecture au XVIIIe siècle, published in 2016 in the collection Sephardi Pepper Court in the Caribbean. Now stressed that the 18th century was a time of immigration in the history of Sephardi Jews, and he based his research on that assumption. However, the 18th century was also a time of immigration of Sephardic Jews in the European societies, both on the mainland and in the colonies. They were part of cross-cultural international trade networks, appeared in general court of, courts of law in Holland and in England, although with some restrictions, bought lands in the southwest of France, again with some restrictions, enjoyed coffee in, in friendly coffee houses in London and Livorno, and in Kinosau, they even joined the local guard and carried weapons. Today, I will explore uh, the influence uh, on the process of integration uh, of the exchanges between uh, the European Sephardim and the Americas. For that purpose, I will examine the case of the Sephardim in Bayonne in the southwest of France. Uh. <laughs> uh. In the south, yes, was it? Okay. In the southwest of France. While now based his research solely on individual cases, I will expand my analysis. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So you can see there where in Bayonne, the, the other communities in Bordeaux, as you see a, a little further north, and the smaller communities were a little bit on the right from Bayonne inside the country, but not really. Very close, about an hour drive I have today. Um, so, in the well known, based his research solely on individual cases, I will expand my analysis to communities one economic, the chocolate makers, and the other, so, the social, the Freemasons. My research on Freemasonry is still in progress, and therefore, that part of my presentation will be briefer. In 1550, Henry II, King of France, issued a decree allowing Portuguese merchants, also known as New Christians to settle in France and engage in commerce. Following the decree, many immigrants from the Iberian Peninsula crossed uh, French borders, both by land and by sea. These immigrants were crypto Jews, Jews who remained in the Iberian Peninsula after the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492 and from Portugal in 1499, and had maintained their faith under covering of Christianity for fear of the Iberian Catholic uh, rulers who had banned the practice of Judaism within their borders. The Iberian crypto Jews who arrived in France were fleeing the mighty state when mechanisms known as inquisitions, uh, which hunted down the clandestine Jews, confiscated their assets, and in many cases executed them by burning them at the stake to the cheers of the crowds. Some of the Iberian immigrants stayed in France, however, the majority left for various destinations around the globe Amsterdam, London, Hamburg, Italy, the European colonies in the Americas such as Suriname, Curaçao, Jamaica, Martinique the British colonies in North America, which later became the United States, the coast of West Africa, and India. In the in new places of residence, many of them went back to practice of Judaism in public and established communities. Despite the distance between these communities, uh, uh, times thousands of miles, the new Jews, as they were defined by the Israeli historian Yosef Kaplan, kept in close contact and set up a powerful global commercial and social network, known today as the Western Sephardic Diaspora. The Iberian crypto Jews who stayed in France settled specifically in the southwest of the kingdom, in Bordeaux and Bayonne, as I showed before, and in rural, uh, rural communities in the vicinity of Bayonne. With the assistance of rabbis in the land process, many of them went back to the public practice, practice of Judaism. 
The French regime was aware of the phenomena but chose to ignore it and the initiatives to expel the Jews occasionally raised by the local authorities were blocked systematically by the King's Court and its local representatives who believed that the Jews contributed to the economic development of the area and to the royal treasury which was often empty. In 1723, King Louis XV issued a new decree of, uh, officially recognizing Portuguese merchants and Jews. Although there, there was no official census in France until 1808, according to various estimates, about 1,000 to 1,500 Jews lived in each of the main communities in Bordeaux and Bayonne on a regular basis, with no more than a few hundred in the rural communities. In Bordeaux and the rural communities, the, the Jews resided at Amrubos. In Bayonne, however, they lived in Saint Esprit de Bayonne, a suburb outside the city walls. Although they chose to live there upon their arrival in the 16th century, later on the municipality of Bayonne prevented any attempt they made to settle within its boundaries and restricted their employment options. In addition, as elsewhere in France and in many countries in, uh, across Europe, the Jews were banned from joining uh, the local professional corporation and were uh, therefore limited mostly to the practice of local and international commerce and banking. As a result, while a small group of merchants was successful and wealthy, most of the Jewish population was poor. Many of them were peddlers, some of whom were chocolate makers. Now, the main uh, secret of chocolate lies in the quality of its ingredients, above all the cocoa beans and in the correct mix of the raw material. The process of chocolate making consisted of the following. The chocolate maker would crush the cocoa beans into a powder using a mortar and a pestle. He would then warm up the powder, reducing it to a bubbling dough, add sugar, and if desired, vanilla extract or any other aromatic spice. He would then place the dough on a stone device and shape it. At the end of the process, he would slice up the final product, the chocolate, and sell it to his customers. As you can see here. That's the work of the chocolate maker. Uh, there are many stories regarding the arrival of chocolate in France, most of them about noblemen or clergymen who returned from uh, Spain. Uh, however, uh, the first person to create cocoa plantations on French land was Benjamin da Costa de Andrade, a former crypto Jew from Portugal who went back to practicing Judaism in public in northeast Brazil, where it, when it was uh, occupied by the Dutch during the first half of the uh, 17th century. The Andrade learned the secrets of cocoa planting from the local natives, modernized the process, and after he, afforded, he was forced to escape from Brazil following the return of the Portuguese, he settled on the French island of Martinique and built up a plantation and a workshop for the commercial production of cocoa beans. In addition, the Andrade planted and processed vanilla, vanilla other, uh, another secret uh, learned from the local natives. In 1685, after the French introduced tough new regulations regarding the residence of foreigners in the colonies, the Andrade had to hand his business over to his French associates and leave the island. He settled on the Dutch island of Curaçao off the shores of Venezuela, where there was a large Sephardic community, and there he planted new plantations. The Jews of Bayonne were involved in the commerce of cocoa from the French Caribbean. For example, in 1753, Abraham Carvalho was the fourth largest importer of cocoa in, from the French island to Bayonne. He, was, he imported about 23,000 pounds out of a total of about 196,000 pounds. But this cocoa was only one of a few brands important to Bayonne and not the best nor the most important. The leading brand was Carac, i.e. cocoa from the Spanish colony of Caracas, Venezuela. Because of restrictions imposed by the Spanish on the entrance of various goods to their ports, the plantation owners in Venezuela conducted successful clandestine business transactions with the Dutch sailors in Curaçao. The Dutch bought um, European goods and slaves, and in return received produce from the plantations, among them cocoa. Uh, in order to control this um, commerce, Spain established a colonial trade company, but it had only a partial success. The Dutch sailors shipped the precious cocoa to Holland and from there through the southwest of France to mainland Spain. The Spanish were avid consumers of the Caracas cocoa and in, a, in an unsigned document from 1700 kept at the Bayonne Municipal Archives, it is specifically mentioned that of all the merchandise arriving from Holland to Bayonne on its way to Spain, the most important is the cocoa from Caracas. The Spanish will not accept any goods from Bayonne if they cannot get Caracas cocoa there. The Jews were, of Bayonne were deeply involved in their commerce all through the 18th century. So much that, in 1764 and 1768, they were responsible for half or more of the American cocoa imported from Holland to Bayonne. 
An important trader of cocoa and other colonial goods was the Lopez Colasso Family Co Company, uh, the archives of which can be found today in Amsterdam and municipal archives. This company had branches in Amsterdam, Bayonne, Hamburg, and later in the 1770s on the Caribbean island of St. Eustatius. And it operated commercial networks together with various port cities in the Atlantic throughout the 18th century. According to local tradition in Bayonne, crypto Jews who immigrated from the Iberian Peninsula to France during the 17th century and settled in Saint Esprit de Bayonne brought the chocolate making craft with them. They prepared the exotic American drink for local clergymen who owned most of the properties in the suburb and therefore practically ruled it. However, the local archives do not provide evidence to support the tradition. The first chocolate maker to be mentioned was uh, in the notary registers, was Jacques de Barrel, who had uh, his uh, illegitimate daughter baptized in 1697. One of the witnesses to the ceremony was a Jew named Bartholomew Cardoz, a member of a prominent Sephardic in Saint uh, family sorry, in Saint Esprit at the time. In 1691, the municipality of Bayonne imposed its first restrictions on Jewish movement and commerce in the city. But it was only when that decree was renewed in 1725 that the clause was added regarding the manufacture and vending of chocolate. Around that time, the presence of Jewish chocolate makers is also noted. For example, on September 1724, Abraham Carvalho was put on trial by the Bayonne City Council for violating the ban on Jews to sell in retail. He presented his tool to the council, uh, three stone devices to prepare chocolate, a mortar, and a pestle two weighing scales, and a knife. A year later, another one was uh, arrested. Uh, it was uh, Abraham Dandrade, born in Spain in 1689 or 1690. Uh, he immigrated to Bayonne at the age of 10, and at some point he decided to move his business to, to Bayonne City from the suburb, and therefore rented a room in the apartment of a widow where he set up his work workshop. The police caught him there with the same tools, uh, and also 26 balls of a uh, uh, prepared chocolate, etc. He was uh, fine, and also the widow was fine. In general, we have noted at least nine Jewish chocolate makers who worked in Bayonne from 1724 until the French Revolution in 1789, as compared to 12 non-Jews members of the Chocolate Guild, which we will discuss in a few moments. In order to determine the social status of the chocolate makers, we compared the names of those who were working in Bayonne with lists of the administration members of the community in the 18th century, published by Gérard Nau. We found out that, uh, with the exception of one who was a minor member of a charity society, none of the names appeared in any list. Uh, although these lists are not complete, we assume that at least most of them uh, were, if not all, to belong to the lower classes of the community, and this assumption seems reasonable when we take into consideration the simple preparation methods of the product and therefore the lack of need for lengthy and complex training for the profession. In the 18th century, uh, in the southwest of France, drinking of chocolate became a trendy pastime that crossed social barriers. The anthropologist uh, Frédéric Duau found many implications of chocolate pots content, uh, registers, in content registers of houses taken by notaries. Uh, the wealthier used uh, silver pots while the poor used copper. For example, for example, uh, Duar found a copper chocolatier, a pot for drinking chocolate, in the house of a Jewish laborer, Abraham Cardoz Losada, and the silver one in the house of a wealthy Jewish businessman, Jacob Jacob Alessandro. An important testimony of the popularity of the American beverage in the southwest of France can be found in the diary of Rabbi Haim Yosef David Azulay de Chida, an emissary from the holy city of Hebron, who traveled twice to Europe during the second half of the 18th century, for the purpose uh, of collecting donations for his community rabbinical seminaries. In his diary, the rabbi described how during his second visit to Bayonne in 1777, and also to Bordeaux, he was repeatedly invited to the homes of notables after the morning prayers to enjoy a cup of hot chocolate. He was also invited to the same purpose in Paris. From Azulai's diary, we can assume that unlike coffee, that according to the American-Israeli historian Elliot Horowitz, was a night drink, chocolate was drunk in the morning. On December 12, 1760, a group of tobacco and medicine merchants filed a petition to the municipality against the Jews. They claimed that uh, some Jews who, in spite of being banned from selling in retail uh, within the city limits, ignored the restriction and sold chocolate, 
tobacco and uh, sugared spices. The petitioners demanded that the municipality forbid the Jews from selling these goods and ban the residents from allowing the Jews to rent properties and use their name falsely, thereby defrauding the municipality. Although the municipality rejected that appeal, claiming that the spice merchant did not support it, the petitioners were encouraged to form a professional cooperation, and they indeed they do so. Uh, very uh, uh, few months after that, and the Bayonne municipality accepted it. And in this uh, uh, regulation that they made, they said uh, that every member, thank you, every member uh, has to be a Catholic and attend the monthly mass. This time, uh, not only uh, after it was approved by the municipality and also the, parla the Parliament of Bordeaux, which was the higher legal authority, uh, not only the Jewish chocolate makers faced with a problem, but so too were the Jewish major employers, the spice merchants. And therefore, a short while after the Parliament of Bordeaux has approved the new corporation, a group uniting the spice merchants and the Jewish chocolate makers was formed, and that was the beginning of a legal struggle against the municipality. It was long, I would not repeat it, but the conflict, because we had not too much time, but the conflict ended uh, when on February 7, uh, 14, 1766, the king court ordered the leaders of the spice merchant and then uh, the Jewish uh, chocolate makers, the, the combined group, and the, the king uh, courts or ordered them to appeal to the Bordeaux Parliament, demanding the dissolution of the Catholic Chocolate Corporation. Four months later, the group leaders uh, followed that order, and uh, a year later on, uh, the Parliament decided to abolish the corporation, sent its leader to pay the court's fees, and refunded the fines that the Jews has to pay to, had to pay to the municipality. So they won. And now, from the lower classes, I'm going to jump to the upper classes. I have little time, but I think we should do it, because we have a very interesting, uh, in front of you, you have a very interesting document uh, that I would like you to take a look while I'm reading it, because uh, it's a very rare document. Um, Within the economic progress of the 18th century, the Western European society uh, became more open to new philosophical ways of thinking, such as deism that preferred the personal qualities of an individual over his religious affiliation. These outlooks established the basis for enlightenment, which was the most important phenomenon uh, of the Western uh, European societies in the 18th century. And one example was the Freemasons' Order, which was set up in London, uh, the idea was a uh, um, spiritual and social order, and they had secret meetings and uh, secret uh, dialect and so on. And um, uh, the new association was compiled of, uh, uh, comprised of local clubs, lodges, uh, which had immense success and was established uh, the lodges not only in England, but also in mainland Europe, in the Americas, and in Muslim uh, North Africa. And although, uh, according to the assumption of uh, Israeli historian Jacob Kratz, Anderson's intent, uh, Anderson was the, the one who um, led that uh, idea of Freemasonry, he was the uh, person who established this uh, order. And uh, according to his uh, intent, uh, it was to preach the rival Christian churches, uh, but his vague, his vague phrasing vis a vis the question of religious affiliation allowed the acceptance of Jews. Now, thank you. Uh, the first Masonic Lodge in Bayonne, Saint, uh, Saint John of the Arts, Saint Jean of the Arts, sorry, established in 1743, was the first to um, um, that the, the only, uh, and the only lodge in uh, France to openly accept Jews before the French Revolution. Moshe Silvavalle, a 19-year-old youngster, was the first Jew to be admitted in 1765, and Silvavalle's most important quality was probably that he was the grandson of uh, the richest and most influential Jewish merchant in Bayonne. A, a, which his name was Isaac Nunes Tavares. A few years later, some other Bionese Jews joined the Freemasonry. All of them were of uh, wealthy families, and uh, there were six Jews in the, in the Bayon Lodge, six Jews out of a total of 18. So a third were of, the, of the lodge were Jews. And um, all of them, or most of them actually, not all of them were young until the age of 35. And they had many troubles, of course, as usual, the, uh, many of the Christians were against that, and there was a fight there, the, the, um, uh, the Lodge split for a while because of that question, uh, but then it came back, Al although the Jews wanted to be promoted, and uh, nobody had uh, promoted them, so there was like a, a sort of uh, retaliation in that sense. And why was it interesting for the... Um, 
uh, Jews, and why was it an attraction? So Pierre Moliere, the director of the Freemason Library and Archives in Paris, France, explained that in the 18th century, Freemasonry was not an establishment, a non-establishment organization that did not conform to norms, and therefore attracted members of the European upper classes who regarded it as an intriguing invention. For the Jews, asserted Jacob Katz, the historian, it was an opportunity because it was their only chance to meet and make contact with circles of the European societies that otherwise shut out Jews. But the American dimension uh, lies in uh, elsewhere. Before the establishment of modern states in the 19th century, a common travel document was the certificate of baptism, which Sephardim did not have in the second half of the 18th century, as they had already been born in a Jewish community. The Freemasons, however, as you have here in front of you, issued their own document, a sort of passport that offered basic details on the member, described his good qualities as a person, and recommended that other Masonic lodges accommodate him. This document allowed Jews who wanted to travel or even to immigrate the possibility of being integrated by an active and well-established community of uh, Freemasons at their destination. The document, again, is a typical example. It was issued in 1796 by Lodge in Paramaribos, to Abraham, a 20-year-old Sephardic man born on the Dutch island of St. Eustatius, whose family was well-rooted in the southwest of France. Abraham's surname is hidden in accordance with the request made by the owner of this document. And uh, another example, and my last example, is the two brothers, Isaac and David Tavares, that they were the sons of a wealthy merchant, Jacob Nunez Tavares, who was uh, one of the leaders of the community, grandsons of the rich and powerful merchant Isaac Nunez Tavares, who I mentioned before, and cousins of Moshe Silva Valle, the first Jew to be accepted to Bayon's Masonic Lodge. Isaac became one of the pillars of the Jewish community during the French Revolution and served as the secretary of the Revolutionary Committee that operated in Saint-Esprit during the 1790s. In 1805, he took part in the establishment of the new Masonic Lodge in Saint-Esprit and served as its first president. His brother David immigrated to saint Eustatius and later on to Martinique where he was engaged in commerce. In 1781 and 1783, he was registered in Masonic Lodge in Martinique, and then it was documented in Curaçao where he got married. Now, uh, did the two brothers, uh, and then I get to the conclusion, did the two brothers uh, take, advantage or take advantage of their affiliation to Freemasonry for the purpose of promoting their international business? This question is a challenge for further research. And in conclusion, which is a... Um, Continuation of what I said, and we might finish. Uh, the two above cases from Bayon demonstrate the importance of the exchanges between the European Sephardim and the Americas in the 18th century to their integration in the local majority societies. For the chocolate makers, a low class group that had to fight daily to make its living, it was all about the economy. Their ability to ensure the study provision of high quality raw material from the America together with their unique proficiency in the craft brought from the Americas via the Iberian Peninsula, allowed them to produce a high-quality uh, product that was appreciated by the consumers in Bayonne and gave them a good reputation. The product was so highly esteemed that the Bayonne uh, Catholic spice merchants preferred to collaborate with them rather than with their co-religionists, the Catholic chocolate makers. On the other hand, the Jewish Freemasons Members of the upper classes found in the Americas well-established communities of Freemasons, members of the upper classes of the local society, who apparently were ready to accommodate them without the difficulties they had to face in Bayonne. Were there also economic or other benefits for the Jewish Freemasons who traveled between Bayonne and the Americas? Were the uh, Jewish merchants such as the Tavares brother able to establish commercial or other relations with the members of the majority upper classes? under the secret auspices of Freemasonry, the question is yet to be explored. Thank you very much.